Come on, little bat. Yes, a good girl. This beautiful bat is a nocturnal, intelligent, clever, flies fast, can fly high, the height of three oak trees. She was found in London, in Knightsbridge, and somebody found her on a pavement. She was a young bat, and I think she hit a London bus. She was slightly damaged and very insecure, and it took a long time to mend the tears in her wings and the wounds on her back. She's a wonderful education bat. She goes round schools and meets children and helps people in the bat world understand what a nocturne looks like. You'll notice the short coat. The ears are rounded. All the fingers are folded back when they're not flying. The little thumb with a curved nail on the end is used for climbing. Each little toe is of the same length, so it's easy for them to hang up. The membrane goes round over the fingers, round the body and over the tail. The tail's very important because it helps them to steer and twist and turn and zoom. Bats rest in the daytime to save energy. The temperature lowers, the breathing slows down, the heartbeat slows down, their bodies get quite cold. They have to raise the body temperature by shivering and pumping their heart. And when they're ready and hot enough, like revving up a car engine, they automatically begin to use their sonar. Handling bats is not rocket science. You just have to be calm, relaxed, and very gentle. And then they feel quite safe. A bat straight from the wild is just like this. You have to say with your body language that my hand is a home for you to snuggle into. It's not a prison. By being calm and relaxed, they will immediately feel safe and they're very happy and they love to be stroked and cuddled. There are people like me who rescue bats in trouble, make them better and get them back to the wild. Every county has a bat hospital. Any bat in the open in the daytime is in trouble. They'll scoop him up in a handkerchief, take him home, put him in a box and then contact a bat person. Hey, my Millie. Good girl. I call her Millie because she came from Millets. And here she is. That's a good girl. And I wrap them, makes them feel really comfortable. And this is a whiskered bat. They're still flying with old plates on up to two or three years and doing daft things. And it doesn't take much for them to lose their confidence. So Millie is feeling a little bit insecure and a little bit worried, a bit underweight. So my job is having checked her over, she's fine, is to get her to relax and feed, put on weight, then I'll test fly her and see if she can go back home. They can't drink until you've warmed them up, but in the nice warm tissue, and I'm gently going to open out the wing to see how it is. Oh, that's a good girl, check all's well. And there's the wing, she's quite happy, me resting it on the tissue. That's the elbow, forearm, wrist, Little claw is the thumb, and those are the fingers. That's it. And all looks well. And I'm going to check the shoulder, make sure it wasn't damaged, being caught under the door. So I'm going to release it. Oh, that pings back beautifully. Nothing wrong with that. You see how the membrane is attached to the little foot? It goes round the body and over the tail. That's how they steer. See how the shoulder is? That's perfect. She's putting the toes on my finger, both working fine. Now let's have a look at the tail, because the bat can't fly if the tail is damaged. Gently unroll the tail. Yes, that's fine, no problem there. The sonar they use automatically when they're wide awake, which is, plays a very important role at night to help them find their way around and detect the insects and their social voice when they're chatting to each other. So when your ears can hear it, as Millie was talking to me, chatter, 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 that's the social communication. I'm very gently going to feel down the back, little half circles. I'm checking and feeling for any hematomas to 
check that the collarbone's all right. If it's broken, it would stick into my finger. I need to feel over the ribs to see if any of the ribs were broken in her accident under the door. It should be absolutely equal both sides. And down over the pelvic area. I know the lower spine's all right, because otherwise her leg would be paralysed. All's well. Check the eyes are all right. Stroke between the ears to look at her little pearly whites. Yes, the teeth are in good condition. Good girl, that's it. Matting could be dried blood, or it could be glue, or cat saliva, or dried mud. Bats don't like going upside down, so I have to be very gentle with her and make sure that we have no matting on the fur, on the tummy. There. Millie has no injuries. She's definitely underweight. So she has to stay with me. I have to take a mealworm and I have to bed it. Look away if you're squeamish. And then I have to squeeze the juices. Think of it as an ice cream. Sometimes when they're dehydrated, they run out of saliva. So I have to offer them a drink as well. Would you like a little bit of moisture on that? Oh yes, that makes it go down much easier. She's got to put on quite a few more grams yet. I like to feel the spongy fat down her back. In the wild, the bats are feeding up manically because they're preparing for winter. And each of our 17 breeding species likes to choose a slightly different hibernaculum, dark, secret, quiet. It's a very good idea to go underground and some species do. In here I've got some juvenile pipistrel bats who I hand reared this year. Some came to me having been abandoned by their mother. And these are juveniles. I had to continue feeding with milk and mealworms they're fully grown. They don't fly well enough. They're too frightened to fly. They haven't learned all the skills from mummy. These ones are Pipistrellus pipistrellus, known as the common pipistrel. They have black faces. We've got the largest personality of all the bats. We're brave, we're gutsy, we've got a sense of humour and we love flying. And they'll eat about 3,000 midges, mosquitoes and small flies in a night. So these little chaps are your friends. You want them whizzing around your garden. And here we have two brown long ears. These ones are moth specialists. Now moths are clever. They can hear a bat coming. And some species close their wings, drop to the ground and scuttle away. Some moths have learnt how to echolocate themselves to detect a bat coming. And some moths have learnt how to make a horrible noise to jam the echolocation and confuse the bats. So a long time ago, these beautiful little bats came up with two cunning plans. One was to whisper the echolocation through that delicate little pink upturned nose so Mr Moth couldn't hear them coming. But in order to hear the soft whispering echo as it bounced back, they've had to grow gigantic ears. And if I gently wake him up, he'll show you his beautiful ears. There. When they're flying, the long ears lift up, rotate and are flung forward. They catch the sound and guide it onto the little ear at the base called the tragus. And the brain of the bat will translate the sound so they understand what's happening all around. There's a row of little hairs along the edge of the big ear, which picks up the vibrations of the insect as it's moving around. They've grown large, dark eyes. They can see in the dark. So when they've detected the moth, they flutter and hover near it, then switch the sound off and look and listen. Hover over the moth and with those gigantic gigantic feet and long curved toenails, they'll grab the moth and take it to their favourite feeding perch. They can live up to 40 years. Bats generally are divided into the two groups, gleaners and hawkers. 
Now the hawking bats are very fast. Streamlined bodies, long narrow wings, coming out at twilight. Then you have the gleaner group of bats. They hunt by stealth, secretly, quietly. Their wings are round. Their fur is fluffy, not short and dense. And they hunt secretly. They have larger ears because generally they talk softer. They've evolved to roost in trees and to forage in woodlands. Oak trees are some of the best trees you can possibly have for producing a great variety of different insects and bats love them. Beech trees are a great favourite too. The hawking bats, they need to drop six foot where they come out and be clear of foliage for fast exit and entry. Whereas the very shy bats like the brown long-eared and the rare barber straw and the beckstein, they flutter and hover under the vegetation, under the canopy, hidden secretly. All our species have different requirements. They need homes. And the odd dead bit on a tree will produce a wonderful breeding ground for the different insects which emerge, which the bats can feed on. Having a pile of old dead logs is a brilliant breeding ground and a wonderful little habitat for insects. What I have learned over all these years is that if you listen very carefully to the bat and watch the body language, it will tell you loud and clear what's wrong with it. And that's what I try and do.